God has a plan for our daily lives. And when he was calling the children of Israel out of Egypt, like we are to, in this present day, call people out of Babylon or confusion, God set up his people with himself in the midst of the camp, the center of the camp. He wants to be the center of our lives. And part of that desire that God has to dwell with us, he wants us to know how to surrender our whole hearts and lives to him. And so he taught the children of Israel what to do first thing in the day. And as you've been here at this family camp, we have had worship at 5 a.m. early. And then when the sun goes down at dusk, that's when we have worship once again. And in order to call our families together to have an orderly, organized time together worshiping God, we must do some planning. Planning. Did God, the Father, and the Son plan for the creation of this earth? They did. They had planning sessions, and that's when the highest angel, Lucifer, got jealous because he wanted to be a part of that planning and that council. And that's when bad things he held on to in his heart and he sinned while he was in that perfect holy heaven. So God wants us to, parents especially, in the home to be planning their worship time. So you need to counsel together, mothers and fathers, counsel together before your worship so that the worship time together is interesting. So we're going to go through a little bit here, first of all, on the planning that goes into the daily altar. Using God's four lesson books. Where was Jesus' education gained? His education was gained from heaven-appointed sources. Heaven-appointed sources. Heavenly-appointed sources are useful work, the study of the scriptures, nature, and from the experiences of life. These are God's four lesson books. God keeps things simple so that we won't forget. We will remember. Can you remember those four things? Let's go over them again. Useful work. Next. Study the scriptures. Third. Nature study. And fourth, experiences of life. All right. God's lesson books, the heavenly appointed sources. What must you bring to receive these heavenly appointed sources? They're full of instruction to all who bring to them what kind of hands? Can you hold up your hands, all the children especially? Hold up your hands. What kind of hands do we need to have in learning? Our slide says willing hands. Where's the will? Up here in your head. That's right. It's where you make decisions and choices. So your hands are going to be obedient to what your will says to do. So in order for us to learn the way that God wants us to learn, we need willing hands. Can you say that? Willing hands. All right. What kind of eyes? Seeing eyes. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the church in the last days. They're called a lukewarm church. A lukewarm church. And the diagnosis of the members, partially, uh, is that they're what with their eyes? 
If you close your eyes, you're blind. So the church in the last days, the lukewarm church, the people are blind. When you're blind spiritually, it means that you don't understand. You may hear some instruction. You may know what they said, but you don't do it. So that would be like being blind. So in order to learn, you must come with what kind of eyes? Seeing eyes. Can you open your eyes real big? Yes, seeing eyes. Close your eyes now tight. Those are blind eyes. You must come with your eyes wide open. All right. The next thing is an understanding what? Heart. Is that the thing that is right here in the center of your chest that beats? Is that what it's talking about? An understanding heart. No. It's when the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about the mind. But there's um, in the United States, there's a holiday. I don't celebrate it, but everybody sends one another these hearts. A heart. And so what does that heart say to the person they give that heart to? Does it say, I love you? <laughs> yes. It says, I love you. God wants our heart. So he doesn't want just our minds. He doesn't want us just to know about him. He wants us to love him. And so that's why God, in the Bible, uses the word heart. Because I think we all understand that. So we must bring to our worship times and then all through the day, what kind of hands? Willing hands. What kind of eyes? Seeing eyes. And what kind of heart? Understanding, Understanding heart. And then we'll be learning like Jesus wants us to learn. Next to the Bible, what is to be our great lesson book? Next to the Bible. Nature. nature. That's right. How many of you like nature? Yes, nature is neutral ground. Most everyone likes nature, and we can use nature to reach people's heart. And Jesus did that when he was on the earth. That's why he spoke in par <coughs> excuse me, parables. He spoke in parables. He told stories. Are you telling stories? He told stories, and that really perked the interest of the people. And then they would also remember what he was trying to say. Next to the Bible, nature is to be our great lesson book. Only the children that have listening ears right now are going to benefit if we are moving our mouths we're t causing someone else not to be able to hear. And we have some things in our bags that we want to learn more about in the, that respect. To the little child not yet capable of learning from the printed page or of being introduced to the routine of the schoolroom, what presents an unfailing source of instruction and delight? What? Nature. Nature. So, what's God's main textbook? The Bible. And what's next to it? Nature. So, those people that know about the Bible and what's in the Bible, what if they don't know very much about nature? Is it going to make a difference in what they know about what's in the Bible? It is. It's going to make a big difference because the Bible is full of nature lessons. But it doesn't go into a lot of information, a lot of facts about those nature lessons. So if you don't know about the nature object lessons, then you're not going to understand in the way that God wants you to the spiritual lessons in the Bible. And in nature, there's a lot of people that understand some things about science. They understand the facts. But if they don't study nature along with the Bible, do you think they're going to miss 
interpret and misunderstand some things in nature? They will. And so God and his plan for education has put them together. So when you study nature, you want to study a Bible lesson right along with it. And what you're going to see in that Bible lesson is laws. And in the nature lesson, you're going to see laws. And you're going to see the same laws in nature as in the Word of God, in the principles of the kingdom of heaven. And that it connects creation, nature, with God. And everything that God has made points us to Him. Everything. And so that's what we want to discover. And that's part of the planning that we have to do in presenting to our children interesting worship time. And that worship time, though, is the start. In the morning before the sun comes up, that's the start for the whole day. And we're going to see in the next few slides what God has to say about your thoughts, about the worship time in the morning, where you're going to take those thoughts with you throughout the day to remember Him. It says that the heart... The heart not yet hardened by contact with evil is quick to recognize the presence that pervades all created things. This statement right here is and can be misinterpreted easily. There's a belief, a philosophy that God is in the tree. God is in the beetle and the bug. God is in the things that he has made. That's a wrong belief. But this quote is saying that the heart not yet hardened by contact with evil is quick to recognize the presence that pervades all created things. And um, <clears throat> The presence, meaning that God, when he spoke, it was so. And so the laws that are in the tree, the laws that govern the insects, the laws that govern uh, the weather, the clouds, uh, light, electricity, uh, all these things the life or the energy, like even in the smallest thing, the atom has energy in it. That energy comes from God. It's not God, but it comes from Him. So the little child that does not have a hard heart because of error and uh, maybe cultivated tendencies to wrong, their hearts are soft to be easily molded with what is right. That's when you want to educate a child um, with the things that we're talking about. I want you to be listening because in these bags are some things that we have been talking about. And I'm going to ask you I'm going to ask some of the older ones to come up and take these bags and go back to their seat and look at them, study them, and then um, share some things with us after they've done that. Uh, but I'll, I just want to kind of prepare you for what I'm going to do with the bags. So be listening so that you can maybe um, write out some spiritual things and principles that we've been talking about, about what's in some of these bags. All right, the ear, as yet undulled by the world's clamor, is attentive to the voice that speaks through nature's utterances. Just before this lecture, I went out to the ocean and I walked as, as I could um, down just a little ways and I had to be sure to um, know that where the entrance to this 
places because it would have been easy for me to get lost out there. And so I walked down the beach a little ways. And when I was coming back, the wind was so strong that I really had to fight each step to make it back here. Um, it was strong to me. So I was out there in nature and I was remembering the things that I've learned about the sea. And uh, God spoke to me uh, while I was out there. That's what we're talking about here. The ear must uh, be undulled to be able to hear these things. That's why it's talking about the younger child and or the one that has trained their ear to listen. I was listening to the stories that I've read about Jesus and how much he loved to be by the sea and take his disciples down by the sea. They were fishermen for the most part. They knew how to work. They knew how to toil. And so these lessons kept coming back to me as I was walking out there. I was hearing the voice of God speak to me in the same type of scenery that the Bible lessons that I've read in the past have, um, have meant a lot to me. What does thinking about the sea, why do we have the sea now? Why? Do you know? Will we have seas in heaven or on the new earth? We won't. So the sea does something. What does it do? Like, it separates. It separates us. It, it took a long time to fly here. Miraculous to be able to fly such a long distance over the sea. Why did God allow that type of separation? Because if we were not separated, sin would flourish. It would multiply like before the flood. Sin multiplied rapidly to the place where God said, I must destroy the earth because sin multiplied so fast. How fast do germs viruses, bacteria, how fast do they multiply? Fast, very fast. So you don't want to, when you're sick, you, the first signs of illness, you want to do something right now. Right now, because if you let it go, it's going to multiply. And the same thing when um, things are happening that are out of order, um, there isn't silence when someone else is speaking. All these things, they would multiply if we didn't put a check on it. And that's why we have this C to separate us so that sin doesn't multiply. What is uniting the world? The technology that we have today, the computers, the internet, it's uniting us with the world. And in that way, we're going to see the end come quickly. We can use these tools to spread the gospel. The last scenes will be rapid ones. How are we using the tools that we have today? If it's to spread and multiply the gospel, then that's a good thing. But at the same time, wickedness and sin is going to spread and multiply rapidly. And so what we must do is to work now while it's day because soon when it is night we will not be able to work. It will be much more difficult to work. So we have today, what a privilege that we have today to meet together and learn more about true education and allow God to change us like he wanted to do with the children of Israel bringing them out of Egypt. And so we're learning how to bring our families once again, once again to gather, to be unified, to be learning, to be educated God's way so that our children will not grow up to settle down here, not necessarily here in the Philippines, but 
to settle down and not be the missionaries that God is calling you to be. Is God calling every one of us to be his missionaries? He is every young person here. He's calling to be a missionary. But in the system of education that we have today, so many get sidetracked away from their mission and they end up just making a life here and life here is just temporary so parents especially um, you can change the course that your family is headed down change the course and so we want especially to think about the children who have the undulled ear that they might be learn to be attentive to the voice that speaks through nature's utterance. That was a deer, a precious deer that I saw. I saw two of them that morning. Oh, I, I hit it like it was my <clears throat> iPad. All right, this kind of education, is it just for the young? It is for all ages. The target, though, for the lessons that we're learning for worship morning and evening here at Bible Family Camp, uh, it is geared for birth to nine years old. My daughter and I did not have that, or my son, um, when they were younger, and so we learned when she was about 16, 17. Glad to see some older young people here. Uh, my daughter and I, and I was in my 40s, so I uh, really dug into this because I wanted to be sure that this was the type of education that God was calling us to. And so this is a pattern of learning these from these four books uh, so that you can learn any subject uh, God's way, using the Bible, nature, life's experience, and useful work. Those are the four books that we pattern true, or God patterns true education after. And so this quote from Child Guidance tells us that older years, those in older years can learn this way as well. It says, and for those of older years needing continually, it's silent reminders of the spiritual and eternal Nature's teaching will be no less a source of pleasure and or instruction. So the older years, no matter what age you are, God intends for you to learn this way, and I believe it's a pattern for how we will be learning throughout eternity. So what you'll need to do is plan and schedule. Do you know what in the body represents a schedule? A schedule is like rules and principles. Rules and principles. How many of you have a skeletal system? That's your bones. Your bones hold you up. A schedule holds you up as well. At Uchi Pines, I have about four or five schedules that I'm in charge of. And if I don't have that schedule and the people that are scheduled to do the work, um, then confusion starts. And so it's so wonderful to have people know how to work a schedule. Things get done that way and they get done to the very best. So parents, you need to plan and have a schedule. We learned that, well maybe we haven't gone over that here, but it's Sabbath afternoon that you look over your next week's lesson from the family uh, Sabbath school material or family Bible lessons. You look over the next schedule and then you begin Sunday morning worship with the new lesson. And um, here I have, you have a Bible lesson, that's the center focus of your worship time. The center focus of your school, your home school. 
And like the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, God sets the sanctuary in the center of the camp. He wanted them to center their life around him. Center their life around him. And when you have been trained a different way and your schedule is already so busy, how are you going to add another thing? You must take this information that you're learning to God in prayer because it is life changing. And so God will help you. We're promised that the Holy Spirit will lead us where? Into all truth. And if you're praying for the Holy Spirit in your life, the Holy Spirit will lead you. If this is the truth, He will lead you there. So you have a Bible lesson, you have a nature lesson, you have a character quality, and you have practical application. Those are the four things you want to touch on uh, for your worships. And fathers are to be the priest of the family, and they're to lead out. And then uh, the mothers, the father can uh, designate what uh, he wants the mother and the children to do during the worship time. And then we're going to find out how to carry this through the whole day, what the Bible tells us we're to do. So you need a plan and a schedule. If you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy 6, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 6. Deuteronomy 6. 1 through 6 and verse 1 says now these are the commandments the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it and what is that in the picture can you see the picture over here where were those statutes and judgments and commandments where did God place them in the sanctuary. Do you know where the Ten Commandments were placed in the sanctuary? They were placed in a box. Do you know, Kevin? Where? The Ark of the Covenant. Where was the Ark of the Covenant? Most holy place. That box, there is a bone in your head that looks like the Ark of the Covenant to remind us once again that God wants his laws in the midst of our hearts in the midst of our hearts I went to uh, a museum and saw the actual bone in the head uh, that represents the Ark of the Covenant in your head. Every one of you carries around with you the Ark of the Covenant bone that is representative of the chest that held the Ten Commandment Law. Studying anatomy and physiology right along with the Bible is the highest education in learning about your body temple. So Deuteronomy 6.1 tells us the commandments. Now these are the commandments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you and ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it. Verse 2, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes. This is what it means to fear God. The first angel's message is what? Fear God and give glory to him. Here in verse 2 of Deuteronomy 6 it says that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments. That's what it means to fear God. And to uh, give glory to him means that you will reflect his character. Which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days be prolonged. Here, verse 3. Here. What do you hear with? Your ears. Okay, keep that in mind because we're going to learn more about your ears. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, God is saying, and observe. 
And verse 4, another one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. So what does God want in your heart? What's in the chest? The Ten Commandments. He wants you to love them. Love the commandments. He wants them to fill your hearts and your minds. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And then it says, now this is true education. Are you ready? Verse 7. And teach, thou shalt teach them how? Diligently. Diligently is not slothfully, not, um, oh, here and there. Diligently, God wants you to teach them unto your who? Who are you teaching them to? Your children. And when do you talk about them? And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So when do you talk about the commandments? All day long. So you had worship this morning. And yes, you're sitting through some lectures, but then when you're not sitting through the lectures, that's when you want to be communicating with your children about what you learned at worship, what you learned in your personal worship, to keep before their minds those principles and laws that you're learning, both in nature and the Bible lesson and the character quality and in practical life. So Deuteronomy chapter 6 is telling us when and how to educate our children. And verse 8, and thou shalt bind them. Where do you bind them? For a sign upon thy what? Thy hand. And they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Where are those <clears throat> who receive the mark of the beast? Where are they going to receive this mark? The hand or the forehead. So see, this goes hand in hand. Those that are following God's command, not God's, man's commands are going to receive the mark of the beast. God is saying for his people to have this mark, what does it say in the hand? Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. This is what you do your work with. I've um, seen some very busy hands since I've been on these seminars. People working, working, working diligently to prepare meals, to prepare um, for the meetings, to prepare their families so that they can um, go to all the lectures. Busy hands, doing what's right, doing what's good. And then also they shall be as frontlets between their eyes. What do you think about? What do you, what do you spend time thinking on? What's between your eyes? What's back in here? Your frontal lobe, the place that you think the place that you reason, make choices, decisions. And your children are going to be thinking on things that you've taught them to think on. And if, you, if they are thinking on the wrong things, then it's up to the parents to bring them back, bring them back to what they should be thinking about and also what they should be doing with their hands. That's what true education is all about. So here we have Deuteronomy chapter 6. And um, I think we just close this. That's We're finished with that. <clears throat> That's pretty much how you prepare for your worship time. And your worship time in the morning, if you, this is specifically if you have young children from birth 
to 8 to 10 years of age. Their whole day at home, let's say you're teaching them at home, their whole day with you parents will be uh, their education, their schooling will be their Bible lesson, their nature lesson, their um, useful work, and life's experience, their, their curriculum. They will actually, uh, the plan is, is that from birth to three years old, they will go through the Bible once. Three years old to six years old, they'll go through the Bible a second time. And by the time they're nine years old, if you started a child at birth, they would have gone through the Bible three times and learned how to see in nature illustrations of the Bible lessons so that they see a bird, they see the ocean, they see a tree, then many lessons, Bible lessons, would come to their memory, like my short little walk out here in the sea. And it's all about, as you have already learned so far, tree education is all about knowing God and communing with Him. And the things that separate us from Him, the things that make us forget Him, the, the ocean, the busyness, the whatever it is, it might be work. God is saying, I want the connection once again to not ever be broken again. I want to know you. I want you to know me. Because when I come back, that's going to be the whole test. Do I know you, God? Does he know you? He's going to say to many, I never knew you. But even though you may be doing good works, you may go to church, you may pay your tithe, you may, it may appear like you're doing everything good. But God may say, I never knew you. So what does it mean to know him? To stay in connection with him? To um, be a living epistle, known and read of all men, like Joseph, in Egypt or Daniel in Babylon. That's what we want our children to grow up to be whatever it is that happens, whatever circumstances in, in life that um, uh, comes to your children, you want them to be able to stand like Daniel, I'm sure, or stand like Joseph, the many mighty tests that are out there. And so this curriculum, the uh, school program that we're presenting this week to you that's free uh, is a pattern for you to be able to implement true education principles into the life. Um, <clears throat> the thing that the materials uh, don't address uh, as much as I would like and um, so what I did uh, even before I had the materials from Sunlight, is I implemented or supplemented uh, our, my children's education with numerous uh, anatomy and physiology and health principle material. Because we're told, and I'm, we're going to go over some uh, quotes about teaching physiology. We're to teach our children uh, as a number one class anatomy and physiology. And to start that part of this lecture, I'm going to ask those that have the felts to come up and put the felts up on the board to help us see one way in which we can teach anatomy and physiology. Uh, the, this is a felt of the human body and uh, children, youth, young people, I would like for you to come up. We should have eight laws of health and we should have some major body organs. Come up and I would like for you to put them on the board. And for those of you who come up, I have a little something for you. Um, we have mentioned already that God has something written on everything that he's made. Come on up and you can put the laws of health here. Let me actually put this. The body, we're told, is a temple. And whose temple is it? 
It's a temple for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to come and live here. Um, actually, uh, the fullness of the Godhead wants to live here. Go ahead, let's put the laws of health here. And if you could put your, let's have you um, say what you have, what body organ. Go ahead and put your law of health up here. So she has water. Water is a law of health. When do we drink water? In between meals. We don't drink juice. We don't drink anything but water between our meals, starting about an hour uh, to two hours after we eat. And an, we stop drinking our water an hour before we eat. And that is to aid digestion. That's a law. It's a principle. All right, let's put up the liver. Do you know where it goes? OK. Go ahead and put it up. Yes, uh -huh, on the body. Good, very good. Okay, here's the liver. All right, you want to put your law of health up here? Good diet, good food, nutrition. So this is the law of health also that we learn what is best for the body. What does God say is best for the body? What did he make there in Genesis creation week that we're to eat? So we need to learn that law as well. And did you have a body part? Okay, you want to put it up? Tell us what it is. What? Oh, the gallbladder. All right. Can, do you know where it goes? Ask the sister if she can put it up for you. Okay, here's the gallbladder. All right. Good. All right. After you've put yours up, could you go ahead and walk down? And uh, let me give you something, though. I want you to take this and put your name on it. Write your name very carefully. And I have some pencils here, too, in this red bag. Go ahead and go down, and then you can pick up the red bag. All right. What is your law of health? Exercise. All right. Do we need exercise? Yes. That's where the useful work came in. God wants us to do, um, we benefit most if we're doing useful work to bless someone else than if we do something like sports, which is all for self and self-glorification. Nothing wrong with throwing a ball, but it's gone too far. So God has us um, getting our exercise by useful work. All right, what do you have there? The intestines, all right. Go ahead and put that where it belongs. Good, glad the um, wind has died down. Thank you. There's the intestines. All right. Oh yes, you wanna put yours up next? Oh, you have a good one, yes. You can put it right here. Uh-huh, you wanna put it up high? Oh, good. Cleanliness. Does that look familiar? Is that what we're talking about this week? Yes, cleanliness. And going over and focusing on these character qual qualities helps us to remember uh, them along with our Bible lesson and nature lesson. All right. And we're going to give um, his mother one of those so she can write his name on that. All right, because I want these name... I want uh, those who participate and volunteer are going to get one of these so they can write their name and we're going to eventually put, uh, I want them all back, all your names, because um, we're going to go through that uh, towards the end and we'll talk more about the name. You want one too? Here you go. All right. And here, the law of health. Oh, there we go. Trust in God. And what body organ do you have? pancreas the pancreas yes today many people are having sick pancreases uh, with diabetes that's uh, when you are diagnosed with diabetes <clears throat> yes it usually has something to do with the pancreas being sick and um, diabetes is actually just a fast way to death you're aging fast is what your body is saying and so um, learning these laws of health and implementing them will slow down the aging process and you'll, uh, your health will be 
uh, restored. All right, next law of health. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Good. And there are pencils in the red bag over on this side. And what is, oh, posture. Yes, posture. Very good. It mean, it's important that we sit straight and we stand straight. And if, you know, my daughter, she'll say, your um, shoulders are rolling, so i got to put them back. And uh, it's very important to stand and sit properly. All right. You want one of these? Yes. Good. Thank you. All right. Good. All right. What is abstemiousness or abstain? What's another word for it? Temperance. Temperance. That's right, self-control. And temperance um, is very important today. Self-indulgence seems to be at its height now. And Sodom and Gomorrah was, oh yeah, where the stomach. Here we've got the stomach. Which way does it go? And if she doesn't put it just right, you know, you can come up later and correct it. Sodom and Gomorrah was burned up because of gluttony, um, idleness, and fullness of bread. Yeah, so the stomach, the poor stomach today. <laughs> it's okay, that's all right. This is a learning experience. Good, thank you. Want one of these? <clears throat> all right, the stomach. Does the stomach need rest? Stomach needs rest. When does it rest? Okay, when you eat, when you eat a meal, it must work. It must do its work, the stomach must. And it, if you're on a vegetarian diet and you're not eating between meals, then it will take about three to four hours for it to digest that meal. Okay, if you haven't overeaten. And if you haven't drunk too much, or yeah, too much water, or eaten something that was really, really hot, for the most part, it will digest the food in three to four hours, and then it needs an hour to rest. So if you're eating every two, three hours, you're not letting that stomach rest. You're going to have problems. So three to four hours, you then uh, your stomach will be resting, especially if you're drinking your water hour to two hours after you eat. These are rules that I have something that hopefully that w we can print so that you'll have these rules uh, and they will help you if you keep going over them and are obedient to them. All right, what do you have? Air, air. How many of you can live without air? None of you. I don't think anyone. Everyone here is breathing. Take some deep breaths. Why don't you stand up, take a few deep breaths, and when you take a deep breath, what goes out? <sighs> okay, I want everyone to stand up. Thank you, let me give you one of these. Okay, oh wait, I think there's a name on that one. Yeah, here we go. Okay, everybody standing up. Okay, let's take a deep breath. Another deep breath, what's going out? Is it your chest or your stomach? Tell me. Okay, whose chest is going out when you take a deep breath? Oh, very good. And whose stomach goes out? Everybody, your stomach should go out when you take a deep breath. And then when you blow it out, your stomach should go in. That, that means you're deep breathing and some people who deep breathe, they actually will like um, go down and up, take a deep breath, and when they go down, they blow it out. Blow it completely out and then take the deep breath again and then let it go out. And it's very important, especially if you're singing properly and even speaking properly, to be breathing properly. So. Uh, there's a lot to learn about uh, breathing. All right, you can go ahead and sit down. Uh, uh, cancer cannot live in oxygenated, uh, an oxygenated environment. So a lot of people are malnutrition when they have cancer, and they um, also are not getting the oxygen that they need. 
All right, what is yours? Sun, you go ahead and put it up here, sun. Good, that is the main one. And Dr. Boutte loves to tell and talk and lecture on the sun and the benefits of the sun and when uh, the best time is to get out and get your sun. Most of the people today have vitamin D deficiency. You get vitamin D from the sun. So here you go. Thank you so much for helping. All right, do you want to put yours up? Rest, rest. Now, thank you, let's give you this too. Do we need rest? When do you uh, get the most amount of rest? Do you know? How many of you like to go to bed like 12, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> um, when I was very sick and I was learning, <coughs> excuse me, these laws of health, I learned that the hours before midnight, you get double the rest. And if you're very sick, do you think the body needs to repair? It does, and I wanted to get well, yet it took me years to get well. Um, but I trained myself, excuse me, I trained myself to go to bed before midnight, quite a number of hours before. And then it's very easy to get up early, early like two, three in the morning. And you can get a lot of study and planning done at an early hour. Ellen G. White, uh, the prophetess uh, of the Adventist church, uh, she would be woken up one, two in the morning and the angel would say, right, right, and she was very ill and her hand would be shaking like this and, and then it would be steadied and she would write many, many pages early before the sun came up. And the spirit of prophecy that we have to enjoy uh, today, uh, all this counsel, especially on health, uh, all the way back to the 1840s that they're finding scientifically today is, is true. Um, it is remarkable what uh, we have, the counsel that we have. It is straight from heaven. And um, the, uh, those who started Yuchi Pines, where I'm working now, um, the Dr. Agatha, she was an atheist, and she came into the truth uh, about uh, what we believe in the Bible to be true uh, through the reading of the book Councils on Diet and Food. She read that book and she said this is remarkable. And so she and her husband have done an amazing uh, work in the health field. I want to bring out to you now that I've mentioned her, uh, this is something that I would buy uh, and I would buy like 50 copies of it. It's a little booklet called Health Emphasis Seminar. And in here, at the time, it cost a dollar. Uh, and this is a, an excellent little booklet to pass out to others. But if you're going to pass it out to others, you want to be sure to benefit from it as well. Uh, there is a topic on depression, uh, perception, memory, and sleep. Uh, also, hyperactive child, uh, effective diet on consumption of alcohol, um, instructions on eating. We may not think we need instructions on eating, but we definitely do. Uh, circadian rhythms, very important uh, when your circadian rhythms are not uh, right because of irregularity. So regularity is very important. Constipation, causes of gas, cheese. Uh, why is it not healthy to eat cheese? How to prevent early maturity of children? Blood pressure. How many people today have problems with blood pressure? Coronary risks. Clothing. Why is it necessary to dress a certain way? Are there health reasons? <laughs> All right. 
And, uh, oh, I felt, so maybe we could have one of the, could you, young man, in the purple, could you come up and take all my felts off? And I have something else that, all right, if you're not willing, would you like to come up and help? Just come up and take these off for me, because the wind is blowing them. And I have something else I want to be demonstrated as well. All right, also cancer. Uh, talks in here about cancer. Weight control issues. And how to treat a cold. Special diet for use in allergies and food sensitivities. And on the very back, there is a a uh, pledge, a pledge, and it's important uh, to make covenants with God, pledges. Oh, thank you very much. And so you can sign the pledge on the back that you pledge to uh, keep God's law, health laws, and uh, continue to study anatomy and physiology and teach it to your, not only your children but those you come in contact with because we should be the healthiest happiest people is it easy to be happy if you're not healthy it's not it's not so happiness and health go hand in hand all right are you curious about what's in the bag or bags. <laughs> All right. What I like is to have six young people. Um, I think we have a group over here that's around 15 or so. Yes. Could could I have like six of you come up? And I want each of you to take a bag, take a piece of paper and a pencil, take the bag. You, I don't want you to show anyone yet. Take it back with you to your seats and I'm going to give you instruction on what you're to do with what's in the bag, okay? So I'll have six of you come up and um, the one in the purple bag, why don't we just have five and the sixth one you come up in a few minutes because I want to tell you a little bit about what's in this purple bag. Do you know what the message... Yes, yes you'd like one? You'd like a bag? Oh, purple would be perfect. All right, I'm going to tell you what's in this bag. Um, it's a cell, all right? This is a model of a cell, uh, a human cell or an animal cell. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the cell, but I'm going to let you take this back with you. Get a, you can maybe go around and get a piece of paper and a pencil from here, and you take this. I want you to do something and I'll tell you. We need five other people to come up and get the bags. Um, <clears throat> yes, good. What I want you to do, those of you who get the bags, and I want you to look inside. I want you to see if you can name what you have. And then I want you to write a few facts about it. You can even draw a picture of it. And, um, and I want you to write a spiritual lesson. A spiritual lesson, yes. So here's two more bags and you have your bag. Go around and get a piece of paper and a pencil. You can, yeah, go down and around. And then you can go back to your seats and um, I want you to look what's in your bag. You can uh, observe it, uh, if you can name what it is, name some facts about it, and think about, you know, how it functions, and see if you can't draw a spiritual lesson from it, either from life experience, or let's see, a Bible story, or Bible lesson, a Bible promise, some spiritual lesson that you draw, you can draw from it. We have one more, one more. Good. And there's uh, one of these in each of the bags because those that volunteer, uh, I would like you to put your name on here and we're going to do something with the names and you can give the name back to me. 
when you do that. All right. <clears throat> the cell. Let's talk about the cell a little bit. And this might give you some ideas about what I'm looking for. How many cells do you have in your body? Do you know? <clears throat> The adult human body contains or consists of more than 50 trillion cells. Those of you who have paper, and if you want to get paper and a pencil, you can come up here if you want to take notes. Okay, those of you, especially the children, if you want to take notes, come get a pencil and paper, and you can write these numbers down. I'd like to see what a trillion looks like. 50 trillion cells. Um, and just to give you a little idea, those of you who are writing these things down, a billion has nine zeros. A trillion has 12 zeros. So this is a, a good way to do some mathematics, All right? So the adult human body has 50 trillion cells. Uh, I'll, I would like someone to look up 1 Corinthians 12, 23, and 24. 1 Corinthians 12, 23, and 24. And when you get that, could you stand up? And I'm going to have you read it, if you would. The cell is, a fu is the fundamental building block of all living matter. The fundamental, and we're talking this week about building, building for eternity. So your body with 50 trillion, if you're an adult, cells, the cell's a building block of all living matter. Everyone needs to understand its structure and its function. How many people need to understand the cell? Everyone. The activities of the cell constitute and promote all life processes. When you get cancer, it doesn't just happen. It happens over a long period of time and your cells begin to mutate and um, they, they just go wild. And uh, so cells are important building blocks. When you eat a healthy meal, you're building your cells. Cells live, they die. And um, they have to be, the dead ones have to be taken out of the body. Okay, let me see about um, picking this, this up. Pardon, there's another one. Yes. I love the uh, natural environment. <laughs> All right. So the cell needs to understand, everyone needs to understand the structure and function of a cell. The activities of the cell constitute and promote all life processes. Digestion, assimilation, excretion, perspiration, oxygen utilization. They synthesize and are, de let's see, uh, degradation of materials, movement, and the excitability or response to stimuli. The impairment or cessation of these activities in normal cells, whether caused by trauma, infection, tumors, degeneration, or congenital defects, is the basis of a disorder or disease process. The cell is very important to the body, isn't it? The cell has something, when uh, the person that has the cell, when you pull it out and you pull it apart, you'll be able to see something called the nucleus. 
The nucleus. What is the nucleus of a cell? Anybody know? Uh, when you have a, a company that you're running, you usually have an administration. That means that's where all the, uh, the workings, the control of that company comes from administration. So the nucleus is the control center of the cell. Do you know what is the nucleus or control center of society? The home, the family. So if you were the enemy and you wanted to destroy a society, where would you aim? Family. The family, the family. So God has a plan to restore the family, the nucleus of society through education. And he desired that of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Could, could God's children of Israel, could they worship God the way that God wanted them to in Egypt? They could not. And so they had to be brought out. And Moses, the leader, the visible leader, bringing those people out of Egypt had to train, he had to be re-educated in order to lead them out for 40 years. Retrained, retrained, re-educated. Before Moses went into the wilderness, he thought he could lead the people. When he came out of the wilderness after 40 years, he said, God, get someone else. I can't do it. He no longer was self-confident. He no longer thought he could do it. And that's when God could use him. When he knew he could not do it. But God had trained him, re-educated him in that wilderness experience. Guiding sheep. That's what we're like. Sheep. That's what your children are like. Sheep. If you call them kids, then you are training them to be like the goats. God's going to divide the goats from the sheep. So what's the difference between goats and sheep when it comes to raising the family? The goats have kids. The sheep have lambs. The goats let their kids just run off, do what they want, go with their friends, have a wonderful time. So they're not really supervised by the parent goats. Those are the kids. The sheep always keep their little lambs within eyesight and hearing distance. Eyesight and hearing distance. They always are watching out for those sheep, those little lambs. Jesus came and he was called the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God, in studying Jesus' life, you'll see how to raise up a little lamb or lambs. Sheep or goats, what do we want uh, for our children? How do we want to raise them? All right. <clears throat> So anatomy and physiology is to be taught. It's one of the first subjects to be taught. I ask uh, you to bring your paper. Um, let's see if I've got it here on physiology. Physiology should be taught. These are some quotes. Let's see what happened to mine. Here it is. I'm going to read just a few of the quotes, uh, just part of them, to give you an idea of the counsel that God is giving to us uh, to teach this so closely. This is the first one on the first page. So closely is health related to our happiness that we cannot have the latter without the former. A practical knowledge of the science of human life is necessary in order to glorify God in our bodies. 
So we are to know the laws of health. I did not know them. At 33 years of age, with two small children, I was about ready to die. And so God said, now is the time. I had made attempts. I had tried to learn them. Well, that's not good enough. God wants you to learn them. Learn them and apply them to the life. Well, I have a, had a second lease on life, a second chance, you might say. I'm still here to be with my, especially my, my children, my family. And, uh, but then at the same time, I can help others. I know what you're going through. When you don't know, you haven't applied these things to the life, um, and your life is busy, it's difficult to implement. But I want to admonish you to save your children, implement the laws of health first and foremost. And then in education, everything we learn, if it's academics, if it's science, if it's nature, we're learning about the laws that govern those things. Learn to put them together. That's what this true education uh, curriculum gives you a pattern to do. Learn to put them together with the spiritual, and you will never forget God and his rules and laws. So, it is therefore of the highest importance that among the studies selected for childhood, physiology should occupy the first place. First place. How few know anything about the structure and function, functions of their own bodies and of nature's laws. Many are drifting about without knowledge, like a ship at sea without compass or anchor. And what is more, they are not interested to learn how to keep their bodies in a healthy condition and prevent disease. Once you have disease, it's very hard to uh, change the lifestyle and uh, then come out uh, better, healthy, restored. The problem is that once you're sick, you never attain to what you could have been. You may, like I am healthy now, maybe somewhat normal, but I will never be as strong and well and healthy as I would have been if I hadn't had broken down health. So we, we will be scarred and we're told we'll be scarred throughout eternity. Though we will only see the scars that Jesus' hands and feet have uh, we're told that it will affect us throughout eternity. Even in our learning experience throughout eternity, it will affect us how we have uh, lived here. If we have sinned, if we have violated God's laws here and we've weakened the body temple, the mind, the most holy place, it will affect us throughout eternity in our learning experience. Hard to imagine what that um, could be like. Um, also, careful, thorough preparation, urgent. Those to whom the care of the little child is committed are too often ignorant of its physical needs. They know little of the laws of health or the principles of development. My mother, when I would get sick, she would give me something. It was a pink medicine called Pepto-Bismol, and she'd give me that if I had a stomach ache, a little 7-Up, and um, some maybe chicken soup. Well, when I was learning natural remedies, I learned charcoal for a stomach problem and no more Pepto-Bismo. And um, so that's how I raised my children. My mother would call the doctor as soon as I had a fever or a problem. And of course, the prescription would be written. And so I learned natural remedies. And my children grew up with natural remedies. We did not call the doctor. We called these laws of health. They are the doctor, Dr. Sunshine, Dr. Good Nutrition, Dr. Water, Dr air, all these are doctors that you apply to your life. You learn how to do this. You save medical bills and you save sickness. You save so much and you train medical missionaries uh, right here in your own home, in your own midst. And uh, what a blessing it is to have like me at Uchi Pines with my daughter and uh, a lot of these students going through never had uh, much training in the area of anatomy and physiology or natural remedies. And so my daughter can help the students even at Uchi Pines. 
uh, understand better how to apply the principles. When you read something out of a book and apply it, that's one thing, but when you have that life experience, uh, you get better and better and better at the practical. And that's what um, we're looking to do. So God is calling each of us to a higher standard and uh, we can provide that for our children and a, a higher education. It says, nor are they better fitted to care for its mental and spiritual growth. They may be qualified to conduct business or to shine in society. They may have made credible attainments in literature and science, but of the training of a child, they have little knowledge. How many parents? I worked at Sunlight Education Ministry for seven and a half years. I was the one who answered the phone calls from all over the world, mothers, fathers, uh, wanting to know how to educate their children God's way. And I would talk to them an hour, two hours, and finally uh, they would say, and what was your name? What was your name? And I'd always know if they asked me my name, they wanted to remember because of what they were told, they wanted to remember it. And if they had any more questions, they wanted to be able to call again. So God is wanting a people that can help others. Uh, and you can do that by being educated right where you are, God's way, the highest education. Upon fathers as well as mothers rests a responsibility for the child's earlier as well as its later training. So who is? Upon fathers as well as mothers rests a responsibility for the child's earlier as well as later training. And for both parents, the demand for careful and thorough preparation is most urgent. Before taking upon themselves the possibilities of fatherhood and motherhood, all of you who do not have children yet, are not married yet, it says before taking upon yourself the possibilities of father and motherhood, men and women should become acquainted with the laws of physical development, with physiology and hygiene, with the bearing of prenatal influences, with the laws of heredity, sanitation, dress, exercise, and the treatment of disease. They should also understand the laws of mental development and training. The Word of God, the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, nature, those were the things that God, Jesus himself, learned from. Jesus walked away from the carpenter's shop and homeschooling education and was the greatest physician. He was the greatest teacher, the greatest counselor, a carpenter. We're told in these last days there will be many that come from just lowly occupations that God will be able to use in mighty ways to help his people come back to the higher education, which is knowing him and being able to practically apply the lessons and principles that he wants for us. All right. This was just a little bit of physiology and anatomy that is so necessary for us to know. I'm going to um, wrap this up, leave you with uh, something that is so important for each of us to understand. This is from the Spirit of Prophecy. It says there is a physiological truth, a truth that we need to consider in the scripture, a physiological truth. There are many physiological truths that we are probably not aware of. And that's found in Proverbs 17:22. Proverbs 17:22. It says, "A merry or rejoicing heart doeth good like a medicine." That's a physiological truth. It acts and reacts on the body. And in the Bible, it says that God inhabits our praises. Is God health? He is all health. And if he inhabits your praises and you are rejoicing and you have a merry heart, you'll find that your, your health will change. There's a chapter in the book, Ministry of Healing, called Mind Cure. 
I would uh, suggest and recommend that you read that chapter. Today there is a lot of mental uh, problems and much of the mental health can be solved by the laws of health and this one which is a physiological truth found in Proverbs 17.22. Have you ever had a doctor prescribe Proverbs 17.22? <laughs> It is that a true doctor is going to pray with you. They're going to prescribe the remedies that God himself has given to us. And um, <clears throat> I'll repeat it one more time. A merry rejoicing heart doeth good like a medicine. We need that kind of medicine, don't we? And love is one of the greatest medicines, love. Uh, showing love and all of God's character qualities encompass love. So when we say we love, that means I'm responsible, I have integrity, I am punctual, I have alertness, attentiveness, all those beautiful character qualities of Jesus. That's what he wants to clothe us in and for him to be able to clothe us, we must be doing our part to study, to find out what those things mean. All right, we're going to have a prayer, and then we'll close this lecture. Let's bow uh, now for prayer. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love towards us, your care, your forgiveness. You care about us. You want us to be educated in your plan, the highest education. Uh, we should, <coughs> excuse me, be the people that... <laughs> nations <laughs> are coming to for <coughs> answers. Thank you for teaching us, for being with us, <coughs> and for filling us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.